Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Is that better? Okay, thanks for joining us today. My name is Shannon Lucas. I'm with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Habitat Conservation Planning Branch. I work on natural community conservation plans, one of which you'll be hearing about today. Uh, today's lecture is part of the conservation lecture series. You can view the schedule and register for upcoming lectures and watch videos of past lectures on the website listed here on the slide. Uh, today we're pleased to have Dr. Stuart Weiss. He is a freelance environmental scientist and founder of the Creekside Center for Earth Observation. He received his PhD from Stanford University in 1996 and is author or co-author of more than 40 scientific publications and dozens of technical reports. Dr. Weiss has worked on imperiled butterflies and plants in the Bay Area for more than three decades. He has been science advisor for the Bay Area Conservation Lands Network and done field work and conservation assessments in the Great Basin and Latin America. His areas of expertise include statistical analysis, GIS, nitrogen deposition, microclimatology, and impacts of climate change, and he is a committed defender of California biodiversity. One of the reasons I asked Dr. Weiss to come and speak today is because he was also a key player in the success of the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Conservation Plan and um, our newest, most recently approved plan. And he was heavily involved not only during the many years of its preparation, but also is currently involved in its early implementation. So thanks for being here today, Dr. Weiss. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it, it, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I checked out some of the other lectures, and it, you're really lucky to have this lecture series. I learned a lot about uh, various species um, from these lectures. So I just wanted to thank. So, OK, better? Yeah, so we're going to take a pretty wild ride uh, through the eyes of the Bay Checker Spot butterfly. Uh, this is the Bay Checker Spot butterfly. Uh, it can be classified as a charismatic mesoinvertebrate in conservation biology speak, and you'll learn a little bit more about its charisma. It lives in this uh, rather beautiful habitat. This is uh, largely native grassland, serpentine grassland, growing on very nutrient-poor serpentine soils uh, filled with native wildflowers and bunch grasses. And the key for the chucker spot butterfly is to have this mix of host plants and nectar sources. The, uh, the little silvery plant here is Plantago erecta, or Plantago. Um, and that's really the most important plant in the world, if you're a checker spot butterfly. That's the primary larval uh, food plant. Uh, it gets nectar, the adults get nectar from a wi wider variety of wildflowers, including the gold fields, the desert parsley, the tidy tips you saw in the other slide. And then this uh, purple owl's clover provides a secondary food source late in the spring after the plantain is dried up. And uh, serpentinite, uh, which is our state rock, did you know that? We have an official state rock. It forms very discrete patches of habitat. So uh, you can see the contact between the serpentine with all the wildflowers on it and the richer sandstone soils that are largely dominated by non-native species. There's still a native component in it, but it doesn't have the host plants and nectar sources for the bay checker spot butterfly. And it forms these island-like uh, archipelagos uh, in the Bay Area, in the range of the checker spot, we have this complex down here in South San Jose, uh, including one very, very large patch of contiguous serpentine that's over 7,000 acres and a series of uh, smaller outlying areas. Up on the San Francisco Peninsula, was former, serpentine was formerly much more extensive. Uh, but it's been really chewed up by development, uh, Highway 280, uh, housing developments, and golf courses. So we, we have these remnant islands of uh, undisturbed serpentine grassland on the peninsula. And we're bouncing back and forth between these areas over the course of the talk. You know, the, the landscape, the flora, I call it a charismatic microflora. You know, the plants are, you know, a few inches high and there are millions of them. 
I often liken it to walking through a Monet painting, but it's even better than that because it's real and it changes from day to day and from year to year. Now just another view uh, looking west towards the Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, the charisma of the checker spot butterfly is such that there's a book about it. This is a compilation of decades of research by Paul Ehrlich and then also Ilka Hansky. Um, I refer to this book as Uncle Paul and Cousin Ilka's Big Book of Checker Spot Butterflies. Um, and it's a model system for population biology and there are hundreds of scientific papers on various aspects of the population biology. Um, it work is in the textbooks. There have been dozens of PhDs done on it. And it really is a heritage of all of humanity because of this uh, immense amount of scientific work done on it. And serpentine grassland itself is a model system. Uh, generations of Stanford University ecologists have uh, studied various aspects of serpentine grassland, the community ecology, the ecosystem ecology, the nature of nutrient limitations. And uh, so it's a very well studied system. And for doing conservation, it, it's, it's really data rich. And I can't tell you what an advantage that's been over the years uh, to have this immense amount of background data. Uh, serpentine grassland also supports the rare endemic flora. Uh, these are some of the species that are actually covered under the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Plan, Santa Clara Valley Dudleya, Tiburon Indian Paintbrush. I'm looking at you, Dan. <laughs> uh, the Central Valley Project Conservation Program is funding a, a propagation experiment with that. Uh, this is called the Most Beautiful Jewel Flower. Uh, must have a great uh, public relations person to be named the most beautiful jewel flower. Mount Hamilton thistle and coyote ceanothus, and there's a bunch of other species. So I'm going to go into uh, the effect of climate and weather on the bay checker spot, but I really want to define climate. And we're really interested in the climate near the ground. So we start off at the broadest level, the macroclimate, which is you know thousands of kilometers down to dozens of kilometers, and that's the global circulation, the synoptic meteorology, the progression of storm fronts, the Pacific high, uh, and all the stuff happening at a real global level. A mesoclimate is where it's modified by the land mass, so like a coastal inland gradient and broad elevational gradients. Uh, the example would be the difference between Santa Cruz and San Jose. The topo climate, which is where we're really going to spend most of our time today, is the effect of topography on uh, climate. Uh, solar radiation across slopes and uh, creating, you know, creating warm slopes and cool slopes, uh, and the relative elevation that uh, drives cold air pooling, so frost frequency, and in fact, the valley bottoms are colder than the slopes above them at night. And finally, you get down to the true microclimate, which is really the effect of vegetation canopies and very fine scale surface features. And at the very bottom of this hierarchy is the organism itself, its physiology, its structure, and its behavior that filter the uh, atmospheric inputs to determine body temperature and water balance. So the way topo climate works in the uh, serpentine grassland is first we start looking at the topography, breaking it down into slope and aspect. So when I refer to a south 30 slope, that's a south facing slope with a 30 degree tilt, so it's very south facing. Flat pretty obvious, and then a north facing 30 degree slope. And all of these are juxtaposed in a uh, you know, pretty fine grained across this local topography. We can turn that into a quantitative measure by calculating solar radiation loads under clear sky conditions. So this is a graph going uh, month by month down here and uh, we have seven different combinations of slope and aspect going from a south-facing 30-degree slope, which is the triangle, 
to the flat, which is the diamond, and then the north-facing 30-degree slope, which is the dark square, and this is measured in uh, megajoules per square meter per day. This is theoretical clear sky radiation. So if we go out about this time of year close to the solstice, we go out on the south-facing slope, 30-degree slope, it's getting about 16 megajoules per square meter per day. The flat is getting about 10, and the steep north-facing slope is getting about 2. Uh, basically, that is just the sky diffuse radiation that's uh, scattered off uh, the sky because it, it's, that's where the sun don't shine this time of year, to put it mildly. Uh, it's just in deep shade. So then we progress through the season, and then by uh, March 21st, the spring equinox, we find that our north-facing 30-degree slope is up at about 11 megajoules per square meter, similar to what the flat was experiencing uh, at the winter solstice. The flat is now up about 17, and the south-facing slope is up close to 25. Now, this is absolutely determined by geometry. So this is something that's really locked into the landscape. And it's determined by latitude, day of year, aspect slope, and horizon shading. So when we go out and measure surface temperatures, we find in this very short grassland, they're very strongly forced by the solar radiation load. So on November 11, 1992, the air temperature was about 17 degrees C. I was measuring it with an a infrared thermometer, um, which is what, uh, what Scotty uses to check the dilithium crystals on the Starship Enterprise. Uh, ama amazing technology, actually. Um, and so we go out on the, the south-facing slope here, and the radiative surface temperature was over 40 degrees Celsius. That's like well over 100 degrees. On the flat, it was close to 30, and then on the steep north-facing slope, it was actually lower than the air temperature because you're not getting very much radiation, and also it's very loosely coupled to the air above it because it's such short vegetation. You get the same pattern here in December. The air temperature is a lot cooler, 12 degrees. The south, steep south slope is 30 degrees. The uh, steep north slope is actually close to freezing. Uh, hadn't warmed up at all from the night before. And the pattern continues through the season uh, on clear days. And it's largely a linear function of solar radiation. Um, so that makes it. So in this environment, we have these black basking bay checker spots larvae growing during the winter. Uh, a couple of things to notice about them. One is they're black, so they absorb radiation really well. They're covered with all these little hairs called setae that create uh, uh, insulation against convective heat loss, so they retain their heat really well. And they basically spend their time feeding on tender baby plantago erecta greens, filling up their guts. Then they find a sunny, uh, wind-sheltered spot. They curl up in the sun to bask and digest their food, which has always struck me as a really idyllic California lifestyle. Um, and when you go out and you take their body temperatures using a fine thermocouple, you see that uh, here's the ambient temperature here, here's the body temperature of the larvae here, and here's the line where ambient equals body temperature. Greatly elevated body temperature. So on a cool winter's day, they're actually operating pretty close to our body temperature because they're such efficient basking. What happens across the topography is that we get this differentiation in their growth rates. So this is from 1985. Uh, we went out and we grabbed samples of larvae off of the south-facing slope, a flat area, a gentle north-facing slope, and a steep north-facing slope. So 200 milligrams on the south-facing slope. This is on February 5th. Uh, a little 125 on the flat, about 50 on the gentle north, and about 20 on the steep north-facing slope. And these differences are maintained through the season. 
so that on the south facing slopes they hit this uh, pupation mass uh, a month or more before they do on the, the steep north facing slope. So the phenology is really spread out because of the topography. Uh, then they pupate, it takes a certain amount of heat for the pupae to develop. They come out as beautiful adult butterflies. They quickly mate. Um, I, fortunately, I don't have time to go into the uh, sex life of a uh, bay checker spot butterfly, but it's pretty interesting, um, but not now. And they fly around in this habitat where basically everything they need is juxtaposed in a very small space. So there's nectar sources, there's host plants, there's other butterflies. Uh, you can go from one slope to another in a few seconds uh, by flying, so you can choose what topo climate you're going to be in. And then the females immediately get down to business. Uh, you see down here with the arrow, there's a little mass of eggs. So they lay masses of eggs. They don't lay eggs singly. They'll lay the first egg mass can be 100 to 150 eggs at the base of uh, Plantago erecta. Then within about a week, the eggs hatch and these tiny little uh, pre-diapause larvae crawl out. These are first instar larvae. They form a web, they feed on the plants, and they molt a few times. And then it takes about 21 to 25 days from the time the eggs are laid to when the larvae go into diapause. And if they don't have that much time with green host plants around, they starve to death and get into a little bit more of that. Um, here's a web. You can see, you know, here's a larva, here's a larva, here's a larva. And, you know, they basically stay in the web for a couple of instars and then they scatter uh, looking for fruit plants. So this is all well and good, it's just within a few weeks the habitat's going to look like this when the rains stop. So there's very little uh, or no host plants around and this is where that mass starvation takes place. And the starvation rates can be on the order of 98, 99 plus percent, um, which we'll, we'll get into the fact that that's actually necessary in the long run. So the phenology of the host plants is also following the topoclimate gradients. Uh, this picture here is showing an opposing south versus north facing slope. Pretty obvious difference. There's still green plants on the north slope. Uh, it's been a few weeks since there's been green plants on the south facing slopes. So we go out and we look at the phenology of the Plantago erecta. Um, over here we have some quantitative data for five different years from 1990 to 1994. Here's time along the x-axis going from uh, mid-March uh, into uh, early June. And the circles are the peak flowering date of the Plantago and the triangles are the senescence date of the plant to go on that slope. So we go over here on the, the, the south facing slope. Uh, we see that there it flowers and senesces a lot earlier than on the north facing slope. And this pattern is largely consistent from year to year. There's some definitely some noise in there. That's the way it always is in these uh, natural systems. But there's pretty regular progression from south slope to north slope in all these years. So you might imagine that we have issues with uh, rapid senescence on the south facing slopes can lead to higher mortality. Uh, the north facing slopes can provide uh, much more opportunities for prediopause survival and uh, we'll see how that plays out in the population dynamics. So high mortality is the rule. A female butterfly will lay about 400 eggs on average over her lifetime. Most of the mortality occurs in this pre-diapause starvation when they run out of food and that's like 98 to 99 plus percent. 
You lose about 50% of them in diapause uh, as they're um, uh, inactive over the summer. Maybe 10 to 20% as the post-diapause larvae that are growing during the winter, about 50% as, uh, as pupae. So on average, two survive to adulthood. Uh, it's 99.5% mortality total. And if it weren't 99.5% mortality total, the world would be overrun with checker spot butterflies uh, pretty quickly, or they will uh, exhaust their food supply. So if the mortality is lower than 99.5%, we see population increases, and then sometimes population booms. If the mortality is higher, we see population crashes. And again, this is all quite variable depending on what slope you're on as a prediapause larva and what year you're in. Key thing to remember here is this, this is an insect. It's not a grizzly bear. So a, a lot of the ways we apply conservation thinking and conservation laws to species like grizzly bears where, you know, really every reproductive female is, you know, a precious part of the population. Um, with, with insect populations, it's a much different uh, way of thinking that uh, can sometimes come into uh, conflict with the way our uh, wildlife laws are written. Okay, so how does this play out in population dynamics? So in the 1980s, they figured out a way to keep track of the populations in a relatively efficient manner, uh, stratified sampling of larval densities across these solar radiation gradients. So the strata are set up as these different colors here. Uh, the red are very warm slopes, the really steep south-facing slopes. The yellow are, you know, less steep south-facing, so warm slopes. The greens are the moderates, which are, you know, flat areas and east and west-facing slopes. And then the light blue are cool, and the dark blue are the really steep north-facing slopes. Uh, we do a 10-person minute timed search looking for larvae in these areas, um, and that translates pretty directly into what the population density is. And using this method, we can cover hundreds of hectares uh, over the course of the season. And we basically have most, almost all of the major concentrations of uh, bay checker spot larvae uh, on Coyote Ridge monitored on an annual basis. Uh, here's an example. Uh, the numbers in these are larvae per 10 person minutes. This was a big year in 2005, so you know here we counted 203 larvae in 10 person minutes. We have little tally clickers, and sometimes your thumb starts getting a little sore. I think our record was 700, in, uh, and I think I was just last year in one site. Uh, so you know, I see we're you know a bunch of these sites are in the hundreds. Some are in, you know, in the tens, and then there's a few that are uh, less than ten. We, uh, in 2009, uh, larvae were few and far between. Uh, numbers are down in single digits in most places, and then, you know, in places like here, we start singing to ourselves: "We're looking for larvae in all the wrong places," and. Uh, David has experienced uh, Creekside uh, field songs, so you know anything that comes to mind. Uh, but al also, we always remember that what goes on in the field stays in the field. <laughs> so when we integrate this, uh, we come up with a population estimate with error bars. So this is the been doing this since 1985 at the Kirby Canyon Reserve, which is 250 acres of a checker spot habitat. Um, in 1985, we estimated there were about 100,000 larvae out there. Had a population boom up to close to a million. Population crash that corresponded to uh, the last really long extended drought. Uh, bump, relative stability another crash, then we went on a tear here, uh, another big peak by 2004, then we had another crash, and then uh, through the current uh, last year, 
uh, we're up at about 200,000 larvae in this area. And um, I would like you to notice that uh, during our recent drought period, the uh, checker spot butterfly has actually been doing quite well on Coyote Ridge because of all this topographic diversity. Now we are also able to track where the larvae are in the habitat, which corresponds to where they survived the previous spring. So this area, if we go over here to the habitat bar, the area is about 20% very cool slopes, 20% cool slopes, 40% moderate slopes, and another 20% are in the warm and very warm. If we go over to the other side of the graph here, in 1985, we see about 80% of the larvae were on 40% of the habitat, with the majority of them on the very cool slopes. And if we just follow the division between the cool and the moderate, we see that the proportions are changing through time. So as the population grew, we saw this shift away from the cooler slopes onto the warmer slopes in the habitat. And then when we had a big decline here from 1988 to 89, we had the shift back to the cooler slopes. So this is kind of bouncing around um, in conjunction with the changes in population size. And then uh, recently, we had uh, a lot of larvae on the moderates and uh, warm slopes most recently. So there's a spatial component to the population dynamics on these uh, topoclimatic gradients. So now we have a time series. We can start looking at you know, what's driving the population. So the first thing you want to do is look and see whether there are weather factors that uh, seem to be driving it. And when we do a multiple linear regression, we find that uh, there's a negative relationship with March, April air temperature. So they do better in cooler springs than they do in warmer springs. And that is largely a function. The warmer springs drive host plants, in essence, a lot more rapidly. So there's less of an opportunity for pre larvae to survive. Uh, interestingly, there's a negative relationship with uh, April rain or uh, spring rainfall. And we believe that this is largely uh, direct mortality that when we get very heavy rains in April and the eggs and the pre-diapause larvae are out there and the adults are flying around, um, it just suppresses their ability, to, the adult's ability to fly and causes things like mold and direct uh, mortality of the eggs and the pre-diapause larvae. So it's not necessarily good to have spring rainfall. You get a positive relationship with early, with fall precipitation. And that's because the, the earlier you get the growing season off the ground, uh, generally it's better, but th there are some exceptions. And then uh, we have a negative relationship, not with the previous year's average population size, but with the average population size over the previous two years. And this corresponds to defoliation of the Plantago erecta. So when you have two successive years of very high larval densities, uh, they strip the Plantago erecta, and those areas that used to be really highly productive have no host plants, no place to lay eggs. So the butterflies have to go somewhere else, and uh, it takes a few years for that to recover. So uh, there is density dependence in this population. Um, in the form of a kind of a hard cap based on the amount of Plantago erecta, because each larva consumes about a thousand Plantago erecta over the course of their yeah, it's a very small plant. You know, I see Dan out there going, wow. Um, yeah, it's a very small plant, so it takes a lot. So we can start seeing, well, are there climate trends that may give us some insight into how it might do in the future? Um, if we look at this March-April temperature here over the period of our study here, there's not really much of a trend. There's a lot of interannual variability. 
Um, over the longer term, there is a there is a trend, and then uh, I haven't really dove into the uh, climate projections and seeing what might happen to the population. That's a project that's just waiting uh, to be done. Um, but because we, we have such a multiplicity of factors that are driving the population, um, it, it's going to be really interesting. Uh, exercise. Now we can get a little more direct at the driving force, so we look at what we call the phenological window, and this is the difference between the peak emergence, which is the square, so that's the adult emergence, and plantago senescence on the, a flat reference slope, which is the circle. The error bars here are the difference between the south-facing slope and the north-facing slope. But we're, for now, we're just going to take the number of days between uh, peak, peak emergence and uh, plantago senescence and use that as an index of how tight the growing season was. So we can see first that the phenology moves around a lot. We have some very early flight years in mid-March in 86, 88, and 97. Uh, we have some pretty late years in 91, 95, and 99. And then uh, when we take that number of the, the phenological window, uh, it varied from 11 days, which was 1988, to almost 35 days, which was, uh, I believe, 1991. And we regress that against the population response. Uh, and we see there's a pretty good uh, positive correlation here. So in this case, timing may not be everything, but since R squared was 63%, I'll say it's 63% of everything here. And uh, this also nicely explains that uh, the shifts that we see in the microdistribution of the larvae because when time is tight, the only place where the lar pre diapause larvae are going to su survive are on the north-facing slopes where the plants dry out late. So it's a refuge for them to have these north-facing slopes, and uh, that's a really key component of the habitat. And, you know, if, if, interestingly, if we look at where the zero line is on the population response, it comes in right about at the length of time required for pre-diapause development. And that's really nice when things like that come in. So 21, 24 days uh, is the kind of the key time period um, that, that will determine whether you're having a population increase or a population decrease. Now, we do see a correlation between uh, the change in the population. So these are population declines here. These are population increases. And the shift along the thermal gradient, which is basically the weighted average position of the uh, butterfly, of the larval population across the thermal gradient. So when it so over here, we're seeing negative shifts. So those are shifts towards cooler slopes. Over here, we're seeing positive shifts. So those are shifts towards warmer slopes. So there's a correlation here. So when populations go up, you see a shift towards warmer slopes, or you tend to. And when populations go down, you tend to see a shift back towards the cooler slopes. And then if we just simply look at uh, the growing season temperature, uh, we see that the uh, cooler the growing season, the more likely you are to have a shift towards warmer slopes, and the warmer the temperature during the growing season, you tend to see a shift back towards the cooler slopes. So it's, a, it's kind of a crude thermometer in some ways. Okay, so now we have this nice long time series. We can do a, a little exercise to figure out what the mean time to extinction would be for a population that exhibits these kinds of dynamics. Uh, it's based on a diffusion approximation. It's turning it into a gambling game, basically. You want to know what the mean 
uh, RFT you know, mean uh, population growth rate is, what the variance on that is, is there any autocorrelation, and then what's the carrying capacity. So when uh, I learned how to do this when we were trying to come up with a clapper rail calculus for the uh, salt marsh, uh, tidal marsh recovery plan. Uh, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty powerful technique for taking an initial look at a time series. So when we run it through the model, I'll spare you the details. Um, we, we first make the assumption that the mean RFT is zero, which over the course of this time series it really is. The variance was 0.59. There's no autocorrelation. Carrying capacity, I set it at a million larvae, which is about the highest we've ever seen. And that comes out with a mean time to extinction of 313 years. Now, you might say, oh, that looks pretty good, but that's the mean. And if you're looking at the full distribution of those extinction times, uh, it doesn't give you like a 95% chance of surviving 100 years. But if we take into account that the population has this uh, density dependent response, and we basically take out the two population peaks where we observed uh, defoliation, mean RFT goes up to point 0.1, everything else stays the same, and now we have a mean time to extinction of almost 3,000 years, and that puts us in the safe zone. This is just one subpopulation or in a, an area on Coyote Ridge. There's a lot of other sites out there where we uh, are monitoring population densities. So I just wanted to show you very briefly uh, you know, what kind of data we get from that. So I'm going to call these subpopulations. Um, here's the Kirby Canyon trace. Uh, some of these are broken time series. Some of them are more continuous since 1991. A uh, couple things to notice is we do have this general broad synchrony that's being driven by the weather. So here's a series of really good years. Here's a series of really bad years. Um, but we do get this local asynchrony that's uh, driven by the topography and the recent population history so that uh, they're not all fluctuating in synchrony, which adds this um, incredible resilience to this population complex because you know, it's like having a very diversified stock portfolio. So uh, you know, when your stocks are doing well, your bonds aren't doing well, and then vice versa, your tech stocks are booming, and you know, you're, you're, you're uh, divesting from, from, from fossil fuels, you know, just all kinds of investment decisions like that. So, uh, this is a really important component of why this population complex is so robust. So just in summary on the population dynamics here, the dynamics really are driven by phenology, the timing of development of the larvae and the food plants, and this is very, very common among animals, especially herbivorous insects. Uh, the weather at the beginning and end of the growing season appears to be the most important, because that's largely defining the length of the growing season. The topoclimatic diversity, uh, the range of solar radiation or insulation equals a range of temperatures equals a range of phenology, and that creates a lot of resilience in the population. So we can look at the other end of the life history spectrum, just a little diversion up into the White Mountains of California. Here's a charismatic megaflora, the bristlecone pine. You go out on the landscape and you can see that over uh, centuries and millennia, the bristlecone pines have been shifting across aspect. So over here, on the north slope, we have a what's a ghost forest that had died off uh, during a really cold period. I, I forget if this was the Little Ice Age or a previous cold period, but the wood sticks around for a long time. Over here on the east-facing slope, we have large trees that are you know 1,000, 2,000 years old, a lot of young trees. But then we can see that the young trees are starting to reinvade the north slope. So the kind of dynamics we see with the checker spot butterfly from year to year 
we, we're seeing a similar uh, type of phenomenon with bristlecone pines that's playing out over centuries and millennia. And it just brings out the importance of getting down to this topoclimatic scale. Uh, here's some temp here's the average hourly temperatures over the summer in uh, at Crooked Creek uh, up in the White Mountains. Uh, you know, at within the, a single square kilometer, there's an eight degrees Celsius difference in the nighttime minimum temperature on average about the same difference in maximum temperature. And this is all within a single square kilometer. So the topoclimatic variation is extreme, and, it's, and the persistence of a lot of species is going to be dependent on these nooks and crannies in the landscape where you do have locally extreme temperature. So that's a checker spot lesson I think we really need to uh, keep in mind. OK. so. Back to the butterflies. So uh, there's another species of caterpillar out there that has been competing for the same habitat. And because of the loss of habitat, the bay checker spot butterfly was listed as a threatened species in 1987. So that brings us into the conservation components here. We know where they are because the serpentine's well mapped out. Uh, we know where the really high quality habitat is based on the topoclimatic variability. Uh, we know who owns it. So uh, you know, there's, there's not very much doubt about what the uh, sort of playing field is here. Um, the value of the habitat. Um, you know, is pretty obvious. And it was pretty obvious to John Muir. Uh, he was walking from San Francisco to Yosemite Valley, and he made these observations. The last of the Coast Range foothills were in near view all the way to Gilroy. Their union with the valley is by curves and slopes of inimitable beauty, and they were robed with the greenest grass and richest light I ever beheld, and colored and shaded with millions of flowers of every hue, chiefly of purple and golden yellow, and hundreds of crystal rills joined songs with the larks filling all the valley with music like a sea, making it an Eden from end to end. Just, just got to love this late 19th century uh, um, flourish of his language. And there's a picture of John Muir in the Sierra Nevada. Uh, here's a picture of me doing a, uh, my John Muir imitation with a Sierra Nevada <laughs> after a long, tough field day chasing butterflies. Um, and the scene is very much as John Muir described. It's still a uh, largely agricultural Coyote Valley. And you know, here we got the, you know, all, all of those uh, flourishy words that he was using. Uh, it's still largely intact. And that's one of the big advantages we have here. We're working with a largely intact ecosystem at this point. We're not dealing with tiny little remnants. Uh, we have a herd of tule elk running around, actually several herds. Uh, and here they are lording over Silicon Valley. Um, and I really want to you know, take my hat off to the California Department of Fish and Game, who have reintroduced tule elk in many spots around the state, rescuing it from a Noah's Ark situation uh, when the last few individuals were rounded up out of a swamp near Bakersfield in the 1870s. You know, real Noah's Ark story here. And here they are now lording over Silicon Valley. So we know where the habitat is, but we started coming across this problem that in the absence of cattle grazing in the South Bay, uh, introduced annual grasses, primarily Italian ryegrass over here on the left side of the fence, completely overrun the habitat except for the very thinnest soils like around this little rock outcrop here. And this happens over and over and over again. And when it happens, the local checker spot butterfly population goes extinct. So in the 1980s, we observed this. And we quickly realized that cow, cattle grazing was absolutely necessary to maintain these habitats. Um, but we didn't really know why. Um, it was just an empirical observation. 
And you know, these are very happy California cows and beautiful wildflowers. So we can go back to John Muir to start getting some insight into what's changed. Uh, the goodness of the weather as I journeyed toward Pacheco was beyond all praise and description, fragrant and mellow and bright. The air was perfectly delicious, sweet enough for the breath of angels. Every draught of it gave a separate and distinct piece of pleasure. I do not believe that Adam and Eve ever tasted better in their balmiest nook. Just makes me roll my eyes there. But, but we do have a baseline uh, for air quality in the Santa Clara Valley, which I believe is sweet enough for the breath of angels. Well, things have changed. This is looking south from the San Francisco Peninsula towards San Jose. And this is pretty typical summertime uh, smog cloud hanging over. Here we are down on Coyote Ridge looking north at it. And I was in a lecture by Peter Vitusik, one of our professors at Stanford, and he described this phenomenon called dry nitrogen deposition. And in a nutshell, smog is slow-release nitrogen fertilizer that is being transferred to the surface and absorbed by the plants, and it's like dumping a certain amount of fertilizer on it. So I'm going to go into a little bit of detail on this. This is all the air pollution chemistry I'm going to throw at you, but we have combustion that's creating nitric oxide, uh, gets oxidized in a photochemical reaction to nitrogen dioxide, and that also uh, is involved in the formation of ozone because of the ozone connection and the direct toxicity of NO2. NOx is a heavily regulated pollutant. Gets further oxidized to nitric acid vapor, then we also have emissions of ammonia, which are coming from things like fertilizer, animal waste, and as we'll see, vehicles and vegetation. And the nitric acid vapor and the ammonia create uh, ammonium nitrate particulates in a reversible reaction. And this is uh, what forms the majority of what we call PM 2.5, the fine particulate matter, um, that there's air quality standards for it because it really kills people. Uh, when you have high levels of PM 2.5. So this dry deposition um, has been well studied across the world, but very few people actually know about it. Uh, in California, we get up to about greater than 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year, and the pre-industrial background is estimated about half a pound per acre per year. Um, for comparison, you put about 100 to 150 on a high production corn field. So that's a lot of nitrogen. Uh, the nitrogen dioxide and the ammonia gases are taken up directly through stomata into the plant, so it's like feeding them through their leaves. Uh, nitric acid and uh, ammonia also stick to surfaces, even dry surfaces. They're very sticky molecules. Uh, particulates and the other gases are relatively minor contributors, and uh, dry deposition is like 80 to 90 percent in polluted regions of California, and wet deposition is of lesser importance in most places except for some of the high snowpack areas in the Sierra Nevada. So when you look at the wet deposition, it looks like California is not having much of a problem, but when you add in the dry deposition, we're uh, really saturating large parts of the state. So I pulled a lot of this data together in this paper that was published in uh, Conservation Biology in 1999 called Cars, Cows, and Checker Spot Butterflies. It talks about the decline of a large uh, butterfly population. I was able to bring together all the threads uh, and make a convincing case. And then, you know, this, uh, I'm a butterfly biologist. You know, air pollution chemistry and nitrogen cycling are a little outside, so I know when I need professional help, so I started tapping into the, uh, the nitrogen folks. So this is uh, Andre Vitnerowitz, works for the Forest Service in Riverside. Not surprisingly, there's a very large air pollution research program in Riverside, being at the receiving end of the LA basin. And we set up a, a network of passive samplers that measure the gaseous concentrations of uh, the various components of deposition, the nitrogen oxide, the ammonia, and the nitric acid vapor. We set them up at various sites around the Bay Area. 
So we have down here Kirby Canyon. That's right. Uh, you know, show the, the uh, butterfly population, also the fence line shot. We have Tulare Hill right here at the uh, the end of the funnel of the Santa Clara Valley. Uh, we have three up at Edgewood, and we'll talk more about that. And then uh, at uh, Jasper Ridge, uh, it's a relatively clean air site. Um, at Edgewood, we have a real interesting experiment. I like to think of it as a fumigation experiment by freeway. We have Highway 280 running right through the serpentine outcrop. So we put a, a station west of the freeway, a station east of the freeway, and a station about 400 meters east of the freeway. Carries about 113,000 vehicles a day and soften at capacity uh, southbound and northbound now. Um, with the most recent tech boom. Uh, this site at 400 meters east was chosen because that's about where I saw, uh, talk about that a little bit later, but it was a transition from bad habitat to good habitat. So when we integrate this into the nitrogen loadings, uh, first thing we can look at our South Bay sites where the grass invasion always takes place. Uh, even up at the top of the ridge, so between 10 and 20 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year, which is approximately the same as pounds per acre. Our two cleanest sites are about 4 and 5 kilograms per hectare per year, and this is where we don't really see a strong grass invasion. And then right by the freeway at Edgewood, uh, we see this highly elevated deposition. Uh, this is partitioned by the different gases. Uh, there's a lot of details here I don't really have time to go into, but one of the things to notice is that ammonia is a really, really important component of the deposition in the Bay Area. So that paper came out, and uh, right when it came out, there was this proposal for a large gas-fired power plant in South San Jose, right next to uh, Serpentine and upwind of the main checker spot population. Uh, it's a large point source, but because this area is already so polluted, the emissions from this plant were just a small increment above the already high background. Um, this cumulative impacts is a really thorny issue for regulatory work, but we really need to get a grip on it. But because the Calpine, the power company, really wanted to build this power plant, it was the first new power plant in California in decades. And we really wanted to get a precedent setting mitigation for nitrogen deposition. We worked out a mutually agreeable deal where Calpine set aside 131 acres, um, of which they already owned about 116 that, that came with the power plant, the serpentine grass line, but we got 15 acres over here on Coyote Ridge, uh, set aside a 1.4 million endowment and are paying the 30-year operating expenses for the mitigation over the life of the power plant, which is about 30 years. Uh, here's the Metcalf Energy Center right here, uh, looking from Coyote Ridge, and this is Tulare Hill back behind it. And then you can see the smog cloud advancing on us from these several million people who are uh, driving their cars and doing other activities that produce uh, air pollution. Okay, that started opening the gates. Uh, to further mitigation, a couple more power plants uh, farther away. Uh, got 40 acres apiece for these, plus somewhat smaller endowments, but we're getting the 30-year operating expenses. The fact that they were far away, almost 20 miles, and had small cumulative impacts did not mean that they didn't have to mitigate. And uh, so that, that's a really important thing to keep in mind. And then uh, there's two more power plants that had to kick in mitigation in San Diego County for impacts on Kino checker spots. And we're beginning to use this precedent to uh, really develop uh, mitigation. Then came like the big project, which was widening Highway 101 in 2001. Uh, that 
led to 540 acres of mitigation and a commitment to developing a habitat conservation plan. And now I am going to bring David Wright up here to talk about some of the regulatory moments behind this. <laughs> You asked me to say a few things about all the stuff that happened a long, long time ago. Um, so as he said, one of the first things that happened was um, the listing of the butterfly. That was a federal listing, of course, because you all know that the state does not list insects. It's explicitly in the state acts that the state will not list insects. But anyway, we have a federal listing, so it's still a state species of concern. Um, and um, I was working for the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service at that time. Um, and I can't take credit really for recognizing that uh, or applying this idea of an indirect effect um, of nitrogen deposition on the bay checker spot butterfly, but one of my um, cohorts at the service, uh, I'd been spreading Stu's paper around and talking about it, cars cows and sucker spot butterflies and talking about nitrogen deposition and the impacts and, the, and uh, what we might want to think about in those lines. And uh, Cecilia Brown took this idea and uh, was writing the biological opinion, the, the regulatory document, um, about that um, power plant. And she said to the, to the project proponents, this is an indirect impact. It's measurable. Um, it's cumulative, it, it adds, it makes things worse for the butterfly, and so you need to do something about it. And that's the origin of that precedent. Um, and then we took that precedent and we applied basically the same kind of formula to the Highway 101. Again, Highway 101 involved um, increased traffic projections, um, increased nitrogen production from vehicles projections, and we could calculate, you know, uh, areas of impact and probable impact to bay checker spot butterflies. Where where else am I going here, Stu? Oh, I, I, I talk about that meeting. <laughs> <laughs> you you probably remember more about the well, meeting I than I do. But uh, but so and this is a big deal. Um, and we as uh, biologists are, are often uncomfortable in these kinds of situations where we're, you know, we're regulators. Uh, we probably weren't trained to be regulators and we're involved in projects that, that uh, come down to millions of dollars. Usually the mitigation is not millions of dollars. In this case it was. Um, but the project was, was tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. So um, it usually is not a huge bite. Um, to the project, but that doesn't mean people aren't upset about it. So you get into a room, it's you, maybe you have, um, you know, a buddy from the service with you, and then the rest of the people in the room are like 25 lawyers and five politicians and, you know, a bunch of other staff members and uh, probably, you know, other non-governmental um, uh, CEOs and uh, so forth that are all unhappy with you. <laughs> So um, you really have to know your law, you have to know your science, you have to um, be able to apply all those together and make a convincing argument that, uh, that is basically unassailable. So there were, there were meetings like that, there was a meeting like that, that uh, yeah, lots of lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, so, so so the initial mitigation for Highway 101 came out to be uh, like five and a half million dollars, but it was out of like a, I don't know, 10, uh, you know, 60 million dollar project and it led to 540 acres. But in the biological opinion, uh, there was a clause about entering into a habitat conservation plan and we'll come back to that. So now we're going to go up to the peninsula, and I call this the case of the drive-by extinction, the search for the subtly smoking tailpipe, which is another episode of crime scene investigation, Redwood City, which I'm sure you've all seen on TV. 
So again, the situation at Edgewood is we have Bay Checker Spot Habitat, the largest serpentine grassland, last population on the San Francisco Peninsula, primarily here in what we call Area B. Uh, 100,000 vehicles a day going by. Uh, I estimate there are about 9,000 larvae out there in 1997, and then this is the picture of the last larva we saw out there in 2002. So the population just collapsed over the course of about five years. The reason was really quite obvious when you were out there. The closer you get to the freeway, the more grass there was and the less plantago. So here's a graph. Here's uh, meters from Highway 280. Here's the freeway. So east of the highway, the prevailing wind is from west to east. Uh, we see there's a zone a couple hundred, few hundred meters coming out where the lolium, the Italian ryegrass, was really the dominant species, uh, and there was very little uh, Plantago erecta, just a few percent cover. Then we get up out to about 300, 400 meters away from the freeway. The Plantago cover goes up. The ryegrass cover goes down. So this, and this took out about 80 percent of the available habitat in that 35-acre area, and that's why the population went extinct. If we look at the deposition uh, environment here, so here's, I just put Highway 280 in here between the west side and the east side of the freeway. We can see that the east side of the freeway here and so at the west are at the same levels that we see in the South Bay where we have the grass invasion, and that it's being driven by ammonia. Now, this is ammonia that is being generated by the catalytic converters we put on our cars to decrease the emissions of nitrogen oxide. So there's like no free lunch here. They, they work a little too efficiently in the chemical reduction, and that's what I call the subtly smoking tailpipe. Uh, we basically have ammonified our urban atmospheres with the introduction of uh, catalytic converters because ammonia is not a regulated pollutant. So what are we going to do about it? You know, I'm tired of watching these things go extinct and not doing anything about it. So we got some money from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. We ran some experiments, and we found that mowing with an early May timing, right when the Italian ryegrass was starting to set seed but hadn't ripened it yet, uh, was really highly effective. Uh, here's a photograph showing a mow line. that This was mowed the previous year. This was not mowed the previous year. And the mowing pass is what I call the rigorous O test, which is obvious. Um, but it also passes the F test. So here's uh, just a measurements right across one of those mow lines in the mowed area. We had uh, close to 35% cover of Plantago erecta and less than 5% uh, non-native grass. In the unmowed area that was just a few meters away, we had 10% Plantago and 30% grass. So we know it works. We've done it multiple times. Now uh, we don't use weed whackers. We, uh, uh, have county staff. It's a county park and natural preserve. So we uh, scaled up our experiments and started mowing. So we have rotational mowing going on. This is an image from Google Earth. And I always like when you can see your test plots on uh, Google Earth. It's really small. It's really, uh, you really know you're having an impact there. So uh, we prepped the habitat, and we proposed and carried out a reintroduction in 2007. And this was an exercise in navigating the regulatory ecosystem because we had to have all the permits and get buy-in from the county, from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And I think we needed a permit from California Department of Fish and Game. Um, but we worked through it because everybody rallied around the checker spot butterfly. We brought up a thousand larvae collected from Coyote Ridge, and we had a celebration out there. Uh, uh, this was during the the flight season, but we had uh, school kids, 
reporters, a solar-powered sound system, some butterfly nets, and we just had a good old time there. Uh, you know, a few words of wisdom. Um, here I am holding up a 20-pound bag of ammonium sulfate to demonstrate, you know, this is four pounds of nitrogen in this uh, bag, just to kind of put things in perspective. And then uh, we finished it up with my friend Deb Lavoy uh, singing uh, as we released uh, some Bay Checker Spot adults onto potted tidy tips. And Deb did a just very soulful version of the uh, Delton John song uh, that has the lines, butterflies are free to fly, fly away. And uh, we had people in tears. I mean, it was a really moving moment. Uh, we had a press gaggle afterwards. There's some uh, checker spot butterflies on the potted plants, and I'm getting interviewed. And we like made all the news stations that night. We dominated the news cycle. Uh, and they did some really, really nice pieces. Um, the reporters really got into it and did thoroughly professional, accurate jobs. Uh, I was really pleased with the press coverage. But it didn't work. So we saw some adult butterflies in 2007, not as many as we had hoped. We found only one larva the next year in 2008, no adults. It wasn't a total failure, but it was about as close to a total failure as you could get. Um, but very disappointing. Uh, this, this is uh, the first Bay Checker spot we saw at Edgewood, and I just, on the spur of the moment, named him Edward the First. And all the Edgewood people were like, oh, how's Edward doing? So personalizing is kind of an interesting uh, way of getting people to buy in. Well, 2007 happened to be the fourth driest year since 1895 in California um, up to that point. And Edgewood doesn't have a lot of topographic diversity, so it's really, really exposed to the overall weather. So uh, that's one reason why it failed. We have some other hypotheses. Uh, you know, the timing looked okay, but it wasn't great, and there was very little of the owl's clover, which is uh, much more important at Edgewood than at Coyote Ridge. Uh, this issue of the butterflies leaving the habitat, the source area is thousands of acres, the recipient area is dozens of acres. This whole uh, recognition of habitat edges and uh, aggregations on hilltops, um, it, it, you got to select for really sedentary butterflies, or what I call flower potatoes in this, uh, in this case. Having a lot of butterflies around is a good indicator that it's high-quality habitat. So one of the sort of fundamental rules of butterfly biology is that your best indication that it's a good place to be a member of your species is the presence of other members of your species. So they interact and they, they tend to stick around. We thought they might have gone through a second diapause. We waited out a year, and no, that didn't happen. So it, it failed. Uh, so try again and again. So we did. We tried again, and we've been working at it since 2011, uh, hoping, using a bigger hammer, more larvae, 4,000 to 5,000, and hopefully hitting a stretch of better years. Unfortunately, we go into a record drought after our first year here, so uh, we're continuing the habitat management, so you can just see some of the mow areas. Uh, we have a monitoring system that uh, volunteers walk a transect system, and I nickname them the checker spotters. So we have somebody doing it every day, and uh, these are 50-meter segments. <coughs> and this was totally unintentional, but you notice it kind of looks like a butterfly wing here. Totally unintentional, but maybe subliminally uh, determined. So, so now we can we do the larval uh, sa sampling as well. But uh, since we're doing this every day, we can get a really good count of the relative abundance of the butterflies. So, 
In uh, 2011, the red line here, we ended up with a total of about 125 observed. In 2012, we bumped that up to about 300. In 2013, we got up above 600. And in 2014, we uh, got up to 800. And, but this is, we're pumping in like 4,000 to 5,000 larvae each year. And you know, this is an index. This is not the count. Um, but we're working on getting uh, more absolute numbers. And then we had nearly 500 in 2015. So we're in the historic range of variability of this population, but it hasn't really taken yet. Um, and at some point, we're just going to have to let it go and adapt to the site. Um, but we're hoping to get like one or two really good years so we can you know, rock out at Edgewood with our butterfly nets here. Yeah, now I'm going to go back to the South Bay. The Santa Clara County HCP NCCP, and it became an NCCP through the insistence of one of the county supervisors who wanted to really do the right thing. It was uh, uh, really, uh, really great. We got local politicians behind this. So it's systematic planning for a 50-year permit. The partners are Santa Clara County, San Jose, Morgan Hill, Gilroy, the Santa Clara Valley Water District, and the Valley Transportation Authority. There's a six-year planning process that really got going in 2005, 2006. It covers the serpentine species. I think there's 19 covered species, most of which are serpentine related. But it also covers the red-legged frog and the tiger salamander. Those are more out in the uh, backcountry ranch lands. The estimated cost over 50 years was $665 million. Now, I have a lot of uh, friends and colleagues in conservation who gasp at that number. But then I remind them, this is Silicon Valley. I mean, this is where somebody like Mark Zuckerberg can say, oh, I'm going to donate $44 billion to charity, my Facebook stock, if you read the news recently. So um, over 50 years, this is what I um, might refer to as accounting noise in Silicon Valley, uh, coming from uh, development fees, grants, and ongoing conservation efforts. And the ultimate goal is to acquire and manage in perpetuity 46,000 acres for covered species. And an important component of this is a, uh, a large endowment at the end of 50 years so we can continue the work. And I think that's really, really key. The, the mitigation projects we work on from the power plants are endowed to, and knowing the money is there year in and year out makes all the difference when you're managing habitat. So uh, whenever you're trying to get a project, get mitigation for a project, make sure there's long-term money uh, well beyond the, the short-term mitigation window. Um, a key component of the development fees uh, is a nitrogen deposition fee, a per car trip generated fee that uh, when you multiply it out comes out to about $34 for a single family home. One time fee up front, and somehow that was really controversial, like it's going to destroy San Jose's competitive to pay 34 bucks a housing unit or you know 10 bucks a car trip. Um, so uh, I, I, it, when I was uh, presenting to the San Jose City Council and they're hemming and hawing over this, I, I went out to Home Depot and I bought a $34 doorknob and I waved it in front of them uh, just just to make the point. Now, a real keystone species in the system is our ranchers like uh, Justin Fields. Uh, Justin is a fifth generation uh, rancher, lives locally, and he works in this co-evolved mammalian complex here. Notice the high mammalian biodiversity. We have Homo sapiens, we've got Equus, we've got Canis, and Moss. And then the, I, there's some gophers and ground squirrels in the background too. So. Um, and, you know, they, 
the, the grazing regimes that they've been using um, have been working really well. This is definitely a case of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Work with them. Their ranchers are very, very perceptive about the condition of their land. But you know, while this uh, HDP was in the planning, we had sort of an, a mini disaster on Tulare Hill. So this is uh, Calpine set aside the south side of the hill. PG&E owns a power line corridor, and PG&E and Calpine did not get along. So PG&E made Calpine put up a fence, so they cut off the northern two-thirds of Tulare Hill from cattle grazing. So in 2002, this is what that northern part of Tulare Hill looked like. Uh, this is what it looked like by 2007. So when, when people ask me, how do you know the nitrogen deposition is having a big impact, you know, the, you, you know, you go from this to that over the course of a few years on serpentine soils that are about that thick, obviously something is wrong. Uh, this I could have David talk about another regulatory moment here, um, but maybe I'll spare him. <laughs> Uh, but it, so, so PG&E needed some permits from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for some work elsewhere. And fortunately, uh, between David and I and a few other people, we had an in, and we told them, "Listen, don't talk to them until they promise to do something about Tulare Hill." Um, so they. They did, and it took like four, and started in 2004, and by 2008 we had a safe harbor agreement. Cows went back on. Um, at, at the same time, we had that on the north side. This is our side of the hill where we were grazing it, and just gorgeous habitat, really great shape. Um, it was really uh, informative to show the PG&E range manager, you know, here's our side of the hill. You know, we have a great management regime. Look at your side of the hill. Uh, they wanted to get all I don't know, just way too sophisticated on the grazing regime, and it's just like no, just, just you know, do it like this. So uh, by 2013 and 2014, the habitat had largely recovered, uh, actually recovered spectacularly, and aided by the drought for sure. So all of this is Plantago erecta. I describe this as Plantago-licious habitat. Uh, some of the highest densities we've ever seen and lots of wildflowers. So in, uh, we reintroduced the checker spot butterfly uh, onto Tulare Hill. We put in 5,000 larvae in 2013, about 3,500 in 2014. Uh, this is just showing a transect system for counting the adults. We also count the larvae. And as of 2015, we came out with 20,000 larvae, plus or minus 9,000. Uh, so we decided that we weren't going to bring any more in. The population was actually almost an order of magnitude higher than it had been in 2002 uh, before uh, virtually disappeared. So here's a success story. Uh, again, Tulare Hill is pretty topographically diverse and uh, really nice habitat. Okay, so, so back to the HCP. Uh, it's an inherently political process. Uh, we launched what I coined Operation Flower Power, which is bringing the people in power to see the flowers. Uh, this is Blanca Alvarado, the county supervisor who uh, pushed for the NCCP and was one of our strong supporters. This is Jerry McNerney, who's now a congressman. Uh, this is the mayor of Morgan Hill. Uh, we took a lot of people up there, and then we developed a docent core. And when I say we, it's kind of, you know, the, a local community of people who just fell in love with the place. And we've taken a few thousand people up there over the course of the last 15 years. When the plan came out in draft form, uh, it landed like a big thud, and suddenly there was a target, and they were thinking of saying, oh, we're going to scrap this. So we rallied at the grassroots and formed a group called Habitat Conservation Now, 
because we needed an organized presence in front of these decision-making bodies. We got $45,000 in a couple of installments from the Moore Foundation. Allowed us to hire grassroots organizers. It was the Native Plant Society, Green Belt Alliance, Committee for Green Foothills, Sierra Club, Audubon, and others. Uh, kind of real pros at doing this. We generated letters, comments, and speakers. And this was deeply appreciated by the planners, uh, you know, the county planners and the city planners who were actually quite invested in the habitat plan and especially the wildlife agencies. Um, I've gotten thanks from people like Kay Goody and Scott Horton, uh, just to, that this was really key. At the same time, they're getting the pressure from the wildlife agencies. Uh, this is going to be a, a dangerous paraphrase of Kay Goody, but she basically told them that this habitat plan is the best deal you're going to get. Uh, and if you turn it down, uh, we just happened to notice that the awful nice water pollution control plant upgrade you have planned there would uh, be a shame if uh, something happened to it. Uh, that's kind of a paraphrase, but, you know, uh, you got to, you know, she played hardball and she really wanted this plan and I, my hat off to her and to Scott for uh, really sticking up for the plan. Uh, as part of our uh, grassroots lobbying, we generated uh, postcards and we bombarded the decision makers with them to the point where they asked us to please don't send me any more postcards. We got the point. And then they worked through all the uh, decision-making bodies. And then by October 3rd, 2013, on top of Anderson Dam, uh, we had a ceremony where they signed the implementing agreement for the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Plan. So this was the work of a lot of people over about a 15-year period. Um, it was sort of an initial gamble. David was telling me that he didn't like the idea of the promise of a habitat plan for the Highway 101 uh, mitigation, but, uh, you know, it was a kind of a leap of faith and a gamble, and it really turned out. So uh, this paper here, when you add up all the mitigation, has generated about $700 million worth of <laughs> mitigation. <laughs> So, you know, it's like, I, I like that kind of impact factor. <laughs> and it could go a long way towards generating more. Uh, just last month, uh, we acquired 1,800 acres that were formerly owned by United Technologies. This is Matt Freeman of the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, a very complex land deal funding from the Wildlife Conservation Board, the Moore Foundation, Central Valley Project Conservation Program, uh, Section 6 money, um, and a very complicated land deal. And, uh, you know, Matt and Andrea McKenzie of the Open Space Authority, you know, just really worked their tails off for this. And Matt just has cows on the brain here. And uh, just as, a, as we were doing a tour of the property, um, we just happened to have uh, three mama and three baby elk come walking by. And if anyone ever asks you if uh, cattle and elk are incompatible or compatible, uh, ask me for this photograph here. Uh, and this is, you know, we did not have an elk wrangler let the elk loose at the opportune moment. They just decided to show up and impress everybody. So in the long run, uh, you know, air quality is getting better, at least on the NOx front. So this is the long-term trend of uh, nitrogen dioxide going down. It's about 50% of where it was in the late 80s. These are just different uh, counties in uh, the Bay Area. So we can really thank the California Air Resources Board and the Environmental Protection Agency um, and this is classic command and control regulation. You know, you will do this. You will implement these technologies. And it works until folks like VW come along. Anybody in here drive a TDI? You know, I, I, know, I, know, I now know a lot of people who have 
uh, Volkswagen TDIs, and they're pretty angry. Uh, the, the trend into the future is continued decreases in NOx. Uh, ammonia is not going down. It's not a regulated pollutant. Um, so we're always we're going to have deposition issues for a really long time. So this is not limited to the Bay Area. The chemical climate of California in terms of nitrogen deposition shows large swaths of the state are getting pretty excessive nitrogen loadings, greater than 10 kilograms per hectare. Um, critical loads for things like grasslands are on the order of five to six. Uh, if you did, I did an overlay for a report of the, to the California Energy Commission uh, of threatened and endangered plants with nitrogen deposition. And basically, we found that 99 out of 225 listed threatened and endangered plants are exposed to greater than 5 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year, which is about where we start really seeing the effect. So it's a very widespread problem. Uh, there's a report. Uh, I can, I can send the reference to you. I forgot to put it on here um, uh, where we did this. And this was with a 36 kilometer uh, scale map. Uh, we have a better map now. And this is an exercise I think is really well worth repeating um, because it, it's affecting a lot of things, including vernal pools. Uh, we see grass invasions in the absence of grazing. This is work by Jamie Marty at TNC at the Consumnus Reserve. This area is estimated to get about 10 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. Uh, basically, it destroys the vernal pools. You lose the plant biodiversity. You change the hydro period. There are, uh, as of 2006, there were 23 threatened and endangered and 22 rare plants in vernal pools. And then uh, fairy shrimp. Uh, California tiger salamander and California red-legged frog, uh, all of which are impacted by this uh, deterioration in the vernal pools. So nitrogen, uh, in my eyes, is really big. And it's probably the biggest global environmental change almost nobody has ever heard of. Um, everybody, everything's carbon, carbon, carbon. But the nitrogen issue is actually uh, way more out of bounds the global nitrogen cycle is way more out of bounds than the carbon cycle is. And it's responsible for coastal eutrophication, uh, terrestrial eutrophication, as we've seen in California, a lot of health issues. Um, and it's not getting any better. And in some ways, we're more addicted to nitrogen because of fertilizers to grow our food than we are to carbon. And it's the reactive nitrogen. You know, 78% of the air around us is nitrogen, but when it turns into reactive form, and that's when it's a real problem. So the checker spot has become kind of a poster child for biodiversity impacts. I'm always getting requests for checker spot photos for nitrogen deposition reports. So I'm always happy because any report that has a picture of a bay checker spot butterfly in it is going to be a better report than it would have been otherwise. So uh, we can perhaps claim some success here, um, but we have a really, really long way to go. Um, and it, you know, finding ways to conserve scenes like this in the face of multiple environmental impacts, I think, is a real challenge uh, for wildlife agencies, for people like me who care about, for scientists, for people who just love nature because we're just assaulting the world in so many different ways and finding ways to apply the laws and regulations that we have that theoretically you know, could make a really big difference and do when they end up applied, I think is something we all really, really need to work for. So thank you. Okay, so we have time for questions. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you and that's so that people online can hear the question as well. And if you are participating online, you can type your question into the chat box and we will read it. Stu, how long does it take to pick up 5,000 bay checker spot larvae? <laughs> 
Um, in person hours. Oh, I'd say maybe 20 person hours. Uh, the next day it's a lot harder because <laughs> your legs are really sore. I mean, we, we pick them up in places where the densities are on the order of you know, one or two per square meter. So, so finding them isn't the right limiting step. And it's pretty amazing. You'll do a pass through an area because you're always walking away from the sun so you can see them basking. And uh, then you go back up and you walk the same line pretty much. It's like nobody, you know, it's like you hadn't collected there at all. They're just so dense. I'm John from Fish and Wildlife. One of the comments that you made about uh, um, finding larvae, and then you also made a comment about how valuable this lecture series was. No doubt you re you heard that one that was on use of dogs. Would that help in this kind of a project? Um, I don't. I, if the if the population is that sparse. The first thing you, you know, we look for larvae. If we don't find larvae, then we go out and we look for adult butterflies. And uh, adult butterflies, you know, provided the weather is good, usually make themselves really apparent because we're trying to find each other. So, so in this case, I don't think the dogs would be, would add add much value. Um, I like the idea of using dogs to find like small incipient weed populations. I didn't get into one of the major uh, habitat management issues we have is that on the UTC property there are several hundred acres of barbed goat grass which invades serpentine soils in the absence of nitrogen deposition because it evolved when it came to California. Really interesting story, and we hadn't been able to um, treat it in the main infestations. We've been able to contain it um, outside of the United Technologies property, but you know, finding those last few plants is really, really key because. And especially something like goat grass. Uh, goat grass, every floret puts out two seeds, one of which will germinate next year, and one of which will have a year of dormancy. So it builds its own seed bank. And it takes like six years of 100% kill to get rid of it from a spot. So finding those last few plants is really, really critical. And I think that's where the dogs might be. Uh, really useful because you don't want to have to, you know, once if, if you missed a few plants and then you, you reproduce this for a few years, suddenly you, you're on another six year cycle to try to get rid of it. Just a, kind of a follow up with respect to climate change. I have a pipe vine swallowtail uh, colony that I started in my backyard along the creek. And over about 20 years, it's really fantastic. They use my house to pupate on it. And I noticed this in November, a lone butterfly flying. I haven't seen a pipe vine flight after probably September in years and years and years. Are you seeing anything like that? Because that really, you know, I mean, I felt really bad for the butterfly <laughs> because uh -huh. he wasn't going to find a mate, and if he did find him or she, there wouldn't be any place to lay the eggs because the you know the yeah we haven't uh, really seen anything like that we uh, in uh, 2013 and 2015 we had very very early flight seasons that started in February but that's not we've seen that before um, 
So we, we haven't seen anything. It, it, now, this butterfly is really strictly univoltine. It's going to have one generation a year because it just doesn't make any sense to, not, to have another generation with an annual host plant in a Mediterranean climate. Hi, uh, thanks for your presentation. And uh, you brought up um, you know, the topographic complexity, and in this system it seems to suggest something about ecological resiliency, even on small scales. Um, I wonder if you could comment on whether as uh, regulators and assessors of you know, habitat and um, parcels for acquisition and so forth, we're doing an adequate job of kind of incorporating things about something simple like that? Yeah. Um, well, I'm working on a project in the Bay Area called the Terrestrial Biodiversity Conservation Climate Change Collaborative, TBC3. It's a terrible name, but we couldn't think of anything better. Um, we're really trying to come to grips with, with that. Uh, the basis for our uh, landscape level modeling is the basin characterization model by Allen and Laurie Flint that gets down to an 18 acre scale. It does the water balance. So instead of just looking at temperature and precipitation, we're actually looking at the flux of water in the landscape, which is way more relevant than raw temperature and pre um, precipitation because it includes like climatic water deficit, which is a great integrated drought stress. Um, I think a place like coastal California actually has a surprisingly high landscape level resilience in that there's nooks and crannies where things like redwoods will persist in small. You, know, you might lose 90% of the redwood forest over a pretty long time period, but there will still be stands of redwoods in like, you know, deep canyons on north-facing slopes that are well watered because of upslope water. And then the things that will replace the more arid adapted vegetation is actually already there in small incipient stands. So that if uh, in managing the transition, if we can manage for native species as opposed to weeds. Um, we can maintain a largely native dominated landscape um, because things don't have to move very far to track climate. Because in coastal California, especially we have this you know, gradient from the coast inland driven by the fog and the marine layer that's in tens of degrees over tens of miles, and then that's all broken up by the fine scale topography. And you know, when you start looking at the fine scale species distributions in these areas, things are really, really mixed up. I and mean, you can have chamois and really arid adapted species living right next to you know Douglas fir and redwoods. And things don't have to move there. in the coast. I think. In the Sierra Nevada, because of the importance of the snowpack, I think it's going to be a much different story. That you, know, you really could see whole forest belts uh, having to move up to track the snowpack. Because the data snow melt is really what determines your seasonal climatic water deficit. But there would still be pockets. You know, these little pockets. Uh, in the nooks and crannies in the landscape where you will have you know, kind of a ritual uh, distribution. So we're working on that. We're trying to come up with measures of landscape heterogeneity for a certain geography, whether it be a watershed or a park or a you know, conservation lands network, um, that can give us a sense of are we doing a good job. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm spoiled working primarily in coastal California, where it actually looks like there's a lot of resiliency at a landscape scale. You know, if you're if you're hoping that what is there on that spot now will be there in 100 years, you're not going to get that. But it may just be you know over on the next mountain, or it could be right across the canyon. 
So, uh, but I think keeping that in mind and the time scale of the change, you know, the thing with the checker spots is we can see it year to year to year. First of all, pines, you can see it because the wood doesn't decay, but you know, how that plays out um, you know, across a complex landscape in mountainous California, I think it's going to be a really, really interesting thing to look at. Hi, Stuart. Um, I always enjoy your talk because you go everywhere and somehow come back. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I enjoy it. Following the butterfly wherever it leads me. Yeah. Um, I don't know how to articulate well this question, but it's kind of similar to like what um, Patrick just asked. Um, you know, like um, when you start talking about climate adaptation and then you want to get the land, which has um, you know, help adapt uh, to those changes. Then, okay, now you want to start thinking about which one you want to purchase for the purpose, right? And then, like that kind of criteria, which is actually measurable, will be super helpful. And I never seen anything like that. You know, um, bringing those science and criteria indicator-driven decision for purchasing. Yeah. Have you ever heard anything about it? Are you We're thinking, thinking really hard about that. Thank you. The, uh, <laughs> Area Conservation yeah. Lands Network. Okay. And I would say the thing we're really focused on for climate resiliency mm -hmm. is the water resource value of land, especially recharge, because recharge is what creates base flow in streams mm -hmm. over the summer. It creates extractable groundwater resources. And it's so easy to screw it up. It doesn't take that much development to change the flow paths and turn recharge into runoff. Now, runoff is valuable if it's going into a reservoir for water supply and you know has its value in the stream, but it's the recharge that's the most precious. So one of the things we can do now using the Flint's uh, basin characterization model is for a piece of land, you can say how many acre feet of recharge does it generate? And you can put it in context. Now and the uh, Groundwater Act is going yeah. to support that study because they want to know the interaction with the sur you know, surface water and the groundwater. Right, uh, yeah. And the, the great thing about uh, recharge over time is that it integrates. I mean, runoff is here and gone. Recharge, you can actually look and say, oh, here's a 30-year average that um, you know, accumulates or, or integrates really well. Um, a, a good example is uh, we're able to take the Flint data, the model output. It's not data per se, it's model output, but it's better than anything we have. And we're able to take a look at this area south of Mount Diablo called the Tosimara Hills. Okay. You see it when you're driving on 580 near Altamont Pass, kind of unassuming grassy hills. Well, it turns out because of the combination of the climate, the soils, and the geology, every acre out there produces about half an acre foot a year of recharge. It's a very low runoff system. Now, that's also the development frontier for the East Bay. So ask yourself, for you. somebody wants to do, put in a thousand acre subdivision that's going to cave over. 500 acre feet a year of recharge. What's not only do they have to supply the water to this new development, which is getting more, but how are they going to replace that 500 acre feet a year of recharge? And that's water that delivers and stores itself. You don't need infrastructure. All you need to do is get out of the way. So. I think one of the arguments I've been trying to make and get out there, and maybe we can help spread it, is that if we start going into this realm of ecosystem services, you know, water trumps everything. 
it's like a qualitative, it's like a quantum leap above all the other ecosystem services. And it all comes down to good watershed management. And we know how to do that. We just got to keep the land from getting built on and then learn how to manage it so that the water yields are maintained both quality and quantity. So, and, and once you start t looking at it at that scale, and I think a lot of the other values of putting together complexes of uh, protected lands, which lands need to be protected, um, starts falling out. Uh, starts falling out a lot more clearly than you know, than it does now, because we now have a map that gives us a first order. Uh, estimate of you know acre feet of recharge. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? I think that's it. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much for being here and for your lecture. And also, I wanted to give a thank you to David Wright for coming and helping, and to Shannon Lucas for organizing this. So thank you so much. Thank you.